morning's text falls in that category that's commonly referred to as the hard sayings of Jesus. And if you consider what it is that he's asking you to do in the context of dating, parent, sibling, child, I'm not so sure Jesus would have made a very good pastor. I mean, much of the job of being a pastor depends on making it easy for people to come to church and then rewarding you when you do. Trying to keep you to stay here in this church. Talk to any church growth expert and they'll tell you how important it is to create a safe, caring environment where people believe that their concerns will be heard and their needs met. The basic idea is to just simply find out what people want and then try to get it to them. So that they decide to stay put as opposed to continuing to look for a new church home. The effort to please, it doesn't stop once people join the church. Most of us pastors will work to make sure that worship is satisfying and that Christian education is appealing. I mean, when you look at the children and see how excited they get about Christian education, and I love the fact they all know that with Tommy, it's Keith who's making the sounds. They know it. They can see Keith's lips moving, but they don't watch Keith. They watch Tommy. Because Tommy has this gift for being able to convey the kind of energy and excitement and the message that they come here to hear. A well-run church is kind of like a well-run home where members can count on each other that there'll be regular meals, that there'll be pleasant surroundings, and that generally they're surrounded with brothers or sisters and that they have each other's well-being in mind and that you actually live in a home where there's pretty good manners. It kind of matches the American ideal of Christians as good upstanding, good-hearted citizens. And there is nothing intrinsically wrong with this picture. But according to Jesus, we can't be disciples unless we're willing to hate our family to carry our crosses, to give up all of our possessions. I mean, how many of us want to do that? How many of us have the intent to do that? If Jesus were in charge of an ordinary congregation, and he greeted everyone coming in through the doors every Sunday morning, and laid this kind of burden on their hearts, I imagine that after about two or three weeks, maybe a month or so, maybe four people left in the <laughs> He would greet newcomers by saying to them, are you sure, are you sure you want to embrace this way of life? It'll take everything that you have. And it has to come before everything else that matters to you. Because plenty of people have launched out saying, I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, only to find out as the journey continues that you don't really have what it takes to continue living that life of discipleship. And if you get too radical and take it to the streets, your life will be in tragedy. So Jesus just simply would say to everyone coming through these doors, why don't you go home and think this over? Because I'd hate to see you get in over your heads. So Jesus, in a way, is kind of the complete opposite of the typical parish pastor. And far from trying to make it easier on people to follow him, he points out how difficult it's going to be. I mean, look at the 14th chapter of Luke, where he's talking about a large crowd that had begun to follow him. They were trailing him from town to town. They weren't people that he had called to be disciples or apostles. They'd simply shown up. And they were bubbling over with enthusiasm. They were jazzed. But Jesus was kind of less than welcoming. He tells them, not to get your hopes up. Because more than likely, you're not going to be able to afford what I want you to give. He suggests that they go home and do a feasibility study before they decide to go around with you. But they won't go. They want to go with you. They want to be among the first to hear 
the new things that he has to say. They want to be in the midst of that radiant energy that just emanates from them. They don't have a clue what the cost of discipleship is going to be. So Jesus is honest with them. Because the worst thing that he can do is to mislead them. And let them believe that they're running off to serve in some peaceable kingdom where they're actually, what they're actually going to do is running off to do battle against the forces of, of evil. And they're unarmed. Why does he say all these things? Disturbing things about hating parents, children, life. He was using a first century Jewish figure of speech that we don't use much anymore. It's a way of stating your preference by pairing two things and saying you love one and hate the other. It would be like saying, I love the beach, but I really hate the mountains. You don't viscerally hate the mountains. You're just saying, I prefer the beach life. I want the wind in my hair. I want the sand in my, coming up through my toes. I've got kinky hair anyway, and when it gets really salty, I don't care that I can't comb it and I look goofy for days. I love the beach. But I hate the mountain hair. I don't like heights. It just simply is a way of saying what you prefer. And what he's saying is, what I want you to do is understand that you have to prefer my way of life to the way of life in the sense that you have with your families. Because Jesus always being a realist. By the time Luke wrote this gospel, people were already being arrested by Roman authorities. If you had just one Christian in your family, just one, the Roman authorities, if they got a bend of it, would come in and they would arrest your entire family, and that means spouse, husband, wife, small children would be taken off, and perhaps they would be executed. So in a sense, to turn and say, I want to follow Jesus, was the equivalent of turning your back to your family and saying, and I'm exposing you to this risk. And you may not be on the same page as I, but your life is at risk because I chose to follow that man. And I think Jesus just simply wants to make sure that you understand what you're getting in for what you're signing up for. He's not threatening us. He wasn't threatening them. He just simply loving us as usual. In his just straightforward way of never lying to us. He refuses to make following him sound easier than it really is. And he wants you to know the cost of discipleship. So that you're not ever following him on the false pretenses. He doesn't want you to get halfway through your mission work and then abandon it. Or take on the forces of evil when you never sat down to determine whether or not you had sufficient resources to prevail against evil. This all sounds maybe too dramatic for us. If it does, maybe we just lost track of it what it means to be a disciple. One of the most difficult things that, that I was challenged by in my early years of ministry, we had, I was living in Michigan at the time, and we had decided that we were going to address all the homeless needs around the road park. So we were going to try to find someone who would sell us a home that we could turn into a homeless shelter feed them, clothe them, give them a place to sleep, begin to look after their medical and health concerns, their needs. Well, no one wanted our ministry in their area. There were only four of us involved. There was an Episcopal rector. There was a Roman Catholic priest. There was a Lutheran pastor whose name was Tom Sin. That's not him, yeah. <laughs> and why? So I thought at one point, Maybe I should, in looking at the resources that I may have, maybe I should go to the United Methodist pastors in the area 
to see if they had some influence that they could have. Or provide funding to help us buy a property where we could then take care of the needs of the homeless. I went out to the largest church on the Richmond District. And I sat down with the pastor there and I explained the needs. And I said, I really could use your help, if not your help in working with the four of us. Maybe there's some finances that you could throw at us and we could use them to sort of sweep the pot for those who may have power of influence. And he said, I can't help you. People aren't homeless and they're not hungry in the West End. I got it. And you know what? He became a Methodist bishop. And I thought, hmm, how's this work? He knew the cost of discipleship. He knows that there's a price that has to be paid politically for everything that you do. A price that has to be paid economically for everything that you do. When you go into our prison system, so we're pretty much all privately on the line. And all you want to do, all you want to do, is just take the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit into that context of lives that most of us are just written off. Out of sight, out of mind. How challenging it is for those pastors to have the kind of ministry that addresses persons who have been discarded by our cultures. I understand that perhaps crimes have been committed. I get that. But I mean, how many of us in our hearts and minds haven't committed some foul deed? We just never were arrested for it. And maybe there wasn't a law against some of the thoughts that we Last night, I came in contact with a person with meth mouth. Familiar with it? Anyone? Methamphetamine mouth? Ice? Acid? What it does to your teeth? Just rot some way out of your face. There's nothing left but little shards. The teeth should have been darkness, stained. And she was waitressing in a metro diner. And I thought, I am grateful that someone had the courage to follow Jesus and offer this person a job, make a life for herself. Because I could see from just her physical appearance that life had not been all that kind. The price that she paid was the very appearance itself. How many of us love that million dollar smile that some of the others gave us here today? She doesn't have it. But she's hungry. She's working. She's got her face, her teeth, and her mannerisms out there, and she's waiting tables. I really didn't know what to say. I was kind of astounded the way because I've never seen that before. I thought about that. And I thought, okay, who's ministering to whom here? I'm sitting there as a pastor more than approaching the night about the church, but I was the one who didn't talk last night. I was the one being shown just how darn blessed my life has been. And how easy it's been just to take it for granted. And how it doesn't often connect to those whose lives labor under the weight of the crosses that they carry. I don't think Jesus would have made a very good pastor. But I think he makes a terrific Savior. And I don't think he's anywhere near finished saving likes of me and you 
in moments like that and others. His best tool has always been the very thing that killed him, that cross that he ended up on. The one he was carrying long before he set his face to go to Jerusalem, he was carrying that cross. Long before he left Herod, Herod's and Pilate's interrogation scenarios and struggled on his way up to Golgotha where he was crucified. He had been carrying the cross long before that day. And then he offered us, <laughs> out of love, to share that cross with us. To let you and me, give you and me an opportunity to get underneath that cross with him, with our shoulders. We're told that Simon, who came from Simon, did that. I don't think he offers us that because he wants us to suffer. <clears throat> but because I think he wants us to know just how alive you and I can feel when we get underneath something that's very heavy. <coughs> how to get excited about some ministry of his can just take the breath away. Especially when you get hold of some necessary thing that God wants to happen in this world. And you find you're one of those persons that he's using, that God's using to get it done. Even suffering itself fails next to what God is doing through the likes of you and me. Simply because we're willing to carry that cross. And if you've ever noticed, if you and I are so tender that we don't necessarily, or we think of ourselves as too weak to share the burden that Christ carries and the cross that he transports throughout the world. If we're not able to get out of his cross with him, I promise you, with an exception, he's willing and able to get out of the crosses that you carry. He will always get on the blood burden you bear. And he will lift until you find that you can move forward step by step in this life. As you make a difference through the cross that he's commissioned you to carry. And given you all the gifts and the abilities to transform this world into his image through every step you take. I mean, discipleship maybe isn't for everyone. Maybe that's clearly what he's trying to tell us. That there are a lot of people who just have no idea what it takes to show them the cross. But I don't think that that means that the rest of us are lost. I think it's for all the rest of us that he took all his weight on himself. And he wants to remind you every Sabbath that we just can't take his presence with us for granted. And that the risks that have begun when we start messing around with God's priorities in the world and saying we'll help out by following him and accepting his discipleship. He just simply wants you to know what the cost of discipleship is. It's simply his way of blessing us as we go. And I think, as in the moment last night when I encountered this young woman, every now and then, we find through her sickness, we're healed. And may we follow the Son of the Holy Spirit.